Carla, hello. Great to see you. Hiya. Hiya. Yeah, nice to see you. Congratulations, because I suppose it's a little while ago. When were you elected Green Party co-leader? When was this? 1st of October. 1st of October? Yeah, it's your honeymoon period. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, and it's been such a a really positive but really intense first few weeks. So we basically went from um, leadership election, then we immediately went and filmed our party political broadcast, then it was Green Party Conference, then it was COP. Uh, So, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, we will be talking about the climate emergency, obviously, because you're the Green Party, so it'd be somewhat remiss if we didn't. I just want to start there. If you're going to do two sentences, Max, Green Party pitch to the nation, what is it? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's that if you've ever thought about voting green, then now is the time. We are, um, we've are we been polling the highest ever over the last six months. We've got more members than ever before. We've got more councillors than ever before. So increasingly, you don't have to worry about voting tactically anymore. It, it, if you if you want green, then vote mm-hmm. green and you'll get green. Well, you cheated there because that's more than two sentences. But Sorry. that's kind of what you're doing there is summing up. And you're mm-hmm. right. The Green Party, according to several polls, is up to 10 percent plus doing very well in, in, in some polls. But in terms of concrete vision for the nation, so rather than summing up, say, the successes, as you see at the Green Party, what's the kind of vision for the net what would a green party led britain look like in a couple of sentences Mm -hmm. Uh, the green vision for the uk is one where we have climate justice and social justice i mean that's the that's the core principles of the green party and that's why i joined so our um flagship policy is a green new deal um and that's about investing in infrastructure and in decarbonizing but also in people so, in terms of, I suppose, the Green Party's potential right now, as we've seen, gone up in the polling, but I kind of wonder if the Green Party at the moment aren't kind of missing an open goal, because obviously people, there's lots of people very angry with the government, which has presided over one of the worst handlings of the pandemic on earth, the corruption, the sleaze, the, you know, social care reformers, which somewhat Toryism, they hammer those who are poorer more than those who are richer. Uh, We've had over a decade of terrible austerity. And now the Labour Party is very much going in a direction of, well, Keir Starmer's speech to the Confederation of British Industry, the Bosses Federation summed it up. To the right of uh, the president of the CBI, he said, you know, when business booms, we all benefit. Um, or when they make when huge profits are made, we all benefit. If that were true, the Labour Party wouldn't need to be founded. It would just all be fine by itself. But even though there are lots of people disillusioned with the Labour Party's direction, it doesn't seem like the Green Party are really doing a big pitch for those voters, saying, look, Labour doesn't actually represent the sort of values that you might be passionate about, but the Green Party is your home instead. I just I mean, where's the kind of that pitch? Well, I think that a lot of people are coming to that conclusion of their own accord, to be honest. Um, But we're not, the Greens are not only about taking votes from Labour. There are lots of people that are coming to us from across the political spectrum, actually. And there are people, you know, we have to be honest, there are people that wouldn't vote Labour um, because they've seen how Labour have behaved on their local council, for example. So it's not about whether they're left or right on the political spectrum, but they've just seen the way that Labour behaves in this, in, yeah, kind of promise one thing and do another or you know, this very kind of top down command and control way that Labour can behave sometimes. And so, you know, that that they they wouldn't ever consider voting Labour. But when they see, you know, quite left wing policies from the Greens, but but perhaps organised in a different way, in a more grassroots bottom up kind of way, um, then then they then they'll switch to us. So, you know, we're just we're just here presenting our policies and, and increasingly people are realising that that's that's what they want to see. And we're getting so, green gosh, elected gosh. all over the place in, in traditionally Labour places, but also in, you know, we've recently won a few by-elections in rural Norfolk, Suffolk, Hampshire, places like that, that frankly, Labour wouldn't get in. Let's talk about some of your policies. I mean, as I say, we'll come specifically onto the climate emergency because it needs its own section. Taxing the rich, what would tax justice look like under the Greens? 
Uh, well, we've just passed a policy at our autumn conference on a wealth tax, and that adds to an existing really progressive set of taxes, um, or tax policy, economic policy, that's all about making sure that those that can most afford to pay are the ones that are doing so. Uh, and so um, that includes specific policies like, um, for example, sorry, I know you said we're coming to the climate emergency, but the thing yeah, about no, Greens no, is that it's, it it's all connected. So here's an example of um, frequent flyer levy. So the way that works is that if you're um, not flying very often, then you don't pay very much. But if you're the kind of person that's taking lots of flights every year, then the tax ramps up because that's acknowledging that actually the vast majority of flights are taken by a very small minority of very well-off people in this country, so they can afford to pay the extra. And it's not putting the burden unfairly on, you know, your average family that just takes a flight once every few years for a holiday, perhaps. Um, and that's just one example, but it gives you a flavour of the approach that the Green Party takes to raising income in a way that doesn't impact those on low incomes it, it it's on those that can most afford it public ownership yeah love it what about it <laughs> what's the policy what would you do with public ownership what what would you take into public ownership and what would what would public ownership look like so green party is and always has been strongly in favor of public ownership of public services um i'm i've i'm a long standing keen supporter of the uh, campaigning organization we own it um, and you'll probably be aware, and if not, check out their website. Um, uh, there's been, you know, research year after year that's shown that a majority of Brits support public ownership of public services. Uh, and it's not even just a preserve of the left. I mean, given the percentages that come out in the surveys, it's clear that, a, you know, a significant number of people that vote Conservative support public ownership of public services as well. So to me, it's a it's not it's not even a controversial issue anymore. I think where um, where the Greens perhaps um, might differ from some in the Labour Party is that that doesn't necessarily mean nationalisation. It might mean municipalisation. So it might mean ownership by local government or it might mean other models of public ownership like cooperatives. Now, in terms of I'm mean, interested in this idea of class politics, because a lot of people who are on the left, a lot of their squeamishness, I suppose, about the Greens is what attracted them about the Labour Party is whatever its faults, it was founded to be the political wing of the Labour movement to represent workers organising together to get more rights. And the reason Labour was founded was because there was only so far those rights could be secured through strikes and industrial struggle. You had to win power at local and state level in order to change those terms and conditions that workers face in order to change their lives properly. And the idea was the bosses had their parties and workers should have their own party too. And I suppose people often worry that the Green Party is a kind of middle-class radical party. It's a party of middle-class radical liberals and in some ways is kind of more, more of a left-wing version of the Liberal Democrats. So I guess my you know question when it comes to class politics, the, the sense of there is a group in society where wealth and power is concentrated and then there's everybody else and there's a clash between their interests and it's important therefore to have movements to represent those interests against those at the top what's your stance on that and what would that mean in terms of policies i i don't think that take is fair to be honest um i think that we've got members and voters from a really wide variety of different backgrounds um, so, for example, in Bristol, where I'm a councillor, we have 24 councillors and, you know, quite a few of those have working class backgrounds. And that's that's increasingly re reflected in the party as a whole. Um, I obviously agree with your analysis of, of the history of why the Labour Party was founded and why it was necessary. And yes, it, it was absolutely necessary. But I think that I and a lot of other people feel that Labour has not sufficiently moved with the times and isn't addressing some of the challenges that society faces today. And ultimately, um, the Green Party was set up because the existing parties were not were not delivering on on the crises that that society faces now. Um, and so, the Greens and Labour, you know, we we have some policies that are similar. We 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 agree, and we we're sort of fighting for the same things in some way. But the Greens, 
add something extra. But we're, well, you know, we, we work closely with, um, w with unions, we support union campaigns. We're the only major party, for example, uh, to support the campaign for a 15% restorative pay rise for NHS workers. And I've personally spoken at a couple of demos in Bristol about that. Labour don't support that, that campaign, that workers' campaign. What would you do about workers' rights, trade union rights? Uh, well, support them. I mean, and we've got really strong policies around workers' rights, whether it's on supporting specific campaigns like that NHS pay one, um, or, you know, generally speaking, um, we've been long-standing supporters of a, of a higher minimum wage, a living wage. And also a policy that we've had right since the beginning is universal basic income, um, which is a safety net you know it's it's replacing the the punitive sort of sanction based universal credit model with a real safety net that gives everyone a, a modest but a guaranteed basic income and the advantage of that is that it's you know because it's not linked to your work it gives you that flexibility to change careers which you know I, for example, you know, the Labour Party was set up in an era when typically people were in one career for their lifetime, whereas now almost nobody's in that position. And so to have the flexibility to be able to change career, to retrain partway through, to relocate, that's really important. Um, and universe basic income also makes sure that people are getting income, whether they're doing something that is valued by our current economic system or not. So um, social care, for example, is really high in my mind at the moment with the with the health and care bill going through. Um, but also um, there was an event I attended in Bristol at the weekend um, called the Invisible Army, which was about unpaid carers. So people who are caring for their loved ones and the carers allowance they receive is appallingly low. Um, and that's because the society we're in at the moment just doesn't value the work they're doing. So measures like a universal basic income would make sure that all work is valued not just sort of traditional old style kind of in the workplace forms of work in terms of younger people they've been battered financial crash austerity in the pandemic form the cordon sanitaire to protect disproportionately older and, and vulnerable people there are younger people who are vulnerable and therefore susceptible to the danger of covid but far rarer uh, and they've suffered, again, terrible consequences economically and socially. What would the, what would the Greens do for young people? Um, well, I think that we are really the party of young people. You can see that from the polling, the numbers of young people that um, would vote Green. Um, the fact that we're the only party that would not only scrap tuition fees, but also write off the debt. Um, and that we believe in free education and that we... Um, have the bold policies on the climate and ecological emergency, which young people are increasingly telling us is really, really important. And, you know, we, we've been there with them since the start and, 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 and they're with us as well. You know, um, uh, so example, again, from Bristol, where I live and where I'm a councillor, one of my newly elected fellow councillors in Bristol, Lily Fitzgibbon, is a 19 year old youth climate striker. She was a co-founder of the youth climate strike in Bristol. Um, and now she's an elect elected representative effecting change with the Greens from the inside. In terms of um, one of the things that younger people are very concerned about, <clears throat> LGBTQ mm -hmm. rights, something that's an article mm -hmm. of faith for younger people. And what I'm mm -hmm. obviously unsurprisingly going to mention is the issue of trans rights, which has become a very big issue in contemporary British society. There's a vicious, I think many would argue, anti-trans campaign in the media, not dissimilar to that waged against gay people in the past with exactly the same tropes and songs being sung. And this is a big deal partly for the Green Party because you are very divided over it. Your predecessor resigned over the issue of trans rights. So given that there are, and look, Labour doesn't have a moral high ground on this, given its own internal mess on transphobia and its failure to deal with institutional transphobia and indeed to deal with uh, notably one member of parliament who has said things which many trans people have found very hurtful and distressing. You've got, you've kind of, you know, the Greens themselves are in a bit of a mess over this. So I suppose, what would you say to reassure trans people? And what are you doing about transphobia within your own party, which, like the Labour Party, is a problem? Mm -hmm. 
Well, first of all, I think it's worth acknowledging that um, this is not a problem, as you sort of indicated, that it's not a problem that's restricted to any one party. Um, and what I find frustrating is that the norm in Europe is for feminism to be trans inclusive. And for some reason, the UK has this divide that doesn't really exist elsewhere. And yeah, unfortunately, the Green Party is not immune. None of the UK parties are. Um, as I mean, I, so I'm queer myself, I'm a queer or, or bi, however you want to say it, cis woman. And so myself and with my trans and non binary friends, I it is scary at times. Um, you know, the rhetoric around conversion therapy, for example, and just, yeah, you're right. A lot, a lot of the transphobia that we hear sounds like reheated homophobia from a few decades ago. And that's depressing in that I think a lot of us thought that society had moved past that. And, and it's also worrying. But I think it's important to acknowledge that the number of people in society who are actively transphobic, I think, and I hope, is actually really small. But there's a much larger group of people who are well-meaning, but who, you know, don't really know or care much about this issue either way, um, or who know a little and have heard a few things. And on the basis of what they've heard, they are a bit concerned about possible impacts on women's rights. But I believe that those people are ultimately reasonable and kind people who, if they get the chance to learn about what it's like to be trans and to understand that all that trans people are asking for is the basic human rights that the rest of us already have, I, I think the majority of people will come around. And that's um, that's why part of mine and Adrian's, my co-leaders, approach to tackling the issue is about creating spaces where people can learn and engage with each other. So we are going to be working with the party's liberation groups uh, and policy groups to facilitate workshops and training that will help members understand each other, understand current party policy, which is really strongly in favour of trans rights, and, and kind of connect that to our shared mission together. And we've got a good model for how that will work because the uh, Jewish Greens, so the, that's the liberation group for uh, Jewish members of the party, have already um, run something similar on anti-Semitism, where they did a roadshow to our local parties um, uh, over the last year or so, uh, virtually. And that was really a well-facilitated space where people, there was no such thing as a stupid question. And people mm -hmm. could, mm -hmm. could, you know, ask questions, you know, they could risk getting something wrong and they knew that people wouldn't come down on them like a ton of bricks. And I think that's what we need to move away from the fear driven narrative towards something that's based on solidarity and compassion. Great. Um, before I ask you about the climate emergency, I suppose one of the reason some might be skeptical about the Greens is looking at its political history, it looks a bit like a shapeshifter. So under Ed Miliband, when at the time, bless Ed, love Ed, but under his leadership, Labour did not offer a compelling, inspiring alternative. I think he wishes they did, in hindsight, uh, to Tory austerity. And the Greens filled the vacuum at the time. I'll be honest, the leadership made a, a series of missteps, which kind of blew up the Greens' advantage at the time. But nonetheless, the Greens got a million votes back in 2015, but they were higher in the polls before they made, I would say, some pretty self-destructive mistakes, but uh, they were anti-austerity, it was to the left of Labour, very clear. Under Corbyn, because Labour moved to the left, that provoked a bit of a crisis for the Greens, and they repositioned themselves as a hard Remain party, which is kind of odd because the Greens traditionally were pro-membership of the EU, but <laughs> actually very critical about the current EU. And it just seemed a bit kind of arm in arm with the Liberal Democrats, Change UK, various centrist celebrities, a leading Green MEP said if they'd been a Labour member, they would have supported Yvette Cooper, who's on the right of the Labour Party. So it looked as though the Greens had shifted from being watermelons, i.e., for those who don't know, <laughs> green on the outside, red in the middle, kind of lefty socialist greens, into mangoes, i.e., uh, kind of liberal Remainer centrists emphasise going for the kind of those who are disillusioned with Labour who tended to be a bit more centrist dad, maybe. <laughs> and 
So people kind of look at that and just think, well, the Greens will just shift and adv- adapt because they don't have these strong roots in the same way, say, the Labour Party, even though the Labour shifts all over the place. That's not a bad example. Um, yeah, that's, that's a really badly chosen yeah. example. I mean, True, sorry. fine. <laughs> I put my hands up to that. So, but look, I've criticised Labour repeatedly all the way through this and beyond. Um, I'm savaged every day on Twitter for that. But the Greens do seem to... The whole point of the Greens, you're right. The whole point about the Greens, though, is is you've got a safe bet if you're pissed off and disillusioned with Labour. But they seem to zigzag around because you were like strong left and then it was very FBPE, remain, re, you know, EU till I, I die, paint the EU flag on my face. I, I really, really disagree with that take. I just, no. Um, we The Green Party's always been anti-austerity consistently. Um, when I joined the party, which was um, just over 10 years ago, Um, We were the only major party that was challenging the austerity narrative, and we are the only party that has continued to do so ever since. Um, And frankly, I don't think I'd have joined the party if that wasn't the case. Um, You know, yes, we took a position of being strongly um, pro remaining in Europe, um, but you're exactly right. That's that wasn't a kind of because the EU is perfect and we we love its centrist tendencies at all, um, that came from a place of recognising that it has its faults and that, you know, the Greens, the Greens have um, been critical of some of the less positive aspects of Europe, but ultimately recognising that internationalism is a good thing and that we're better in it and part of it than, than outside in an isolationist worldview. The Greens are you know, proudly an internationalist party. We're, we're really well connected with our sister parties um, across Europe and the world. And so that's really important to us. But that, just because the Lib Dems are also pro-Europe for different, you know, for slightly different reasons, doesn't mean that we agree with them about their other policies. It just means that we agreed with them about that. And this idea that we moved to the centre during Corbynism Sorry to be a bit, I don't know, push back a bit hard, but the only people I've ever heard seriously try to argue that are like Corbynites who 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 are using it to justify what you know who they voted for and where they've moved over the few years. I, you know, we've been consistent. We've you know the the, the, the policies that that you described that we had. Um, uh, you know, pre-Corbyn era um, are the same policies that we had during the Corbyn era, are the same policies that we had now. And in many cases, we had them for decades before that point as well. Um, and I'm, yeah, really proud to be in a party that has such radical policies. I, I think that's a real positive. Greens have policies that go further on equality and social issues than Labour ever has and maybe ever will. So things like universal basic income, um, renters' rights, you know, we we support a rent cap, uh, land value tax rather than council tax, which is a much more progressive way of taxing um, taxing land and property, wealth tax. We haven't manoeuvred to the left to take up a space now that's been vacated by Keir's Labour. We've had these policies for decades. From my perspective, um, from my, our generation, Labour have spent most of their time that I've been around in the centre. They briefly joined us on the left and now they've returned to the centre. How much of a disaster was COP26? It was pretty bad. Um, I I, I don't think it was a huge surprise to a lot of people, Um, but it was a disappointment. Uh, so I was I was up there in Glasgow, as were many other Greens, um, and our our mission there was to put the Greens' bold but common sense policies at the centre of political debate. So the things that we were talking about uh, were policies like a carbon tax, um, which would be levied on high carbon products and services, um, and it's a phenomenally popular policy. So there was this really interesting research that came out um, probably a month or so ago now um, from Demos. It was the largest survey of public opinions on climate policies that's ever happened. 22,000 people, representative sample from across the UK. um, And people ranked uh, which climate policies they preferred. And carbon tax came out with 94% support. 
Now, 94% of Brits don't really agree about anything. So to have 94% of Brits saying that they supported this policy, even though they understood that that meant that some products and services would be more expensive, they knew that that was the way to get to a just transition and that that tax can be then, you know, that there's a redistributive element to that tax that can be used to um, pay for better, more reliable, more affordable um, public transport, for example, and to provide a social dividend to those uh, on low incomes to help them make the transition and to adapt to the climate change that's already coming down the track. And that and that's Green Party policy. So to have 94% of the public saying we agree with the Green Party on this is obviously nice to see. Um, and it wasn't only that, there were other, other policies that came out in this survey as well. So we were at COP making that clear and pushing for measures like that at COP. And yeah, we, we didn't see them. I think the only <clears throat> that, you know, the chink of hope, well, there's a few. Um, one of them is that the UK does um, stay as the chair of COP for the next year. And so there is still opportunities to put pressure on the UK government to make up for the fact that there was somewhat of a missed opportunity uh, in Glasgow, that they, they can still fix this if they're so driven. Um, and the other is that while international negotiations are really important, we don't have to wait for the next COP to take urgent action. National governments and local governments, which you know are smaller and often more nimble, um, can take action now. And so the 460-something Green councillors um, across England and, and more in Scotland are now going to be focusing on what their cities or counties or towns can do without having to wait for the Tory government, without having to wait for international agreements, what we can do now. A lot of people, I mean, look, public concerns, if you alluded to, has gone up over the climate emergency. I think there were two main reasons for that. Well, I know the poll, the statistics are very clear. COP26 played a role, but actually the protests over climate emergency. We, 2019, the polling's very clear. Existence rebe Extinction Rebellion, often actually quite unpopular itself, as protest movements often are at the time, but actually their protest did make people think about the climate more and therefore concern went up. That's just objectively what happened with the polling. And we've seen to get the same again, insulate Britain, often profoundly unpopular. I've interviewed them on this channel, again, as protest movements often are at the time, that they have succeeded, whether people like them or not, in pushing the climate up the agenda and obviously COP26. But a lot of people in the abstract think the climate emergency is a big problem. Mm -hmm. but they get bored thinking about it. They switch off. They think it's abstract. They think it relies on too much science. They think they have more everyday pressing concerns to worry about, like jobs, homes, living standards. Yeah. So how do you make a populist case to tackle the climate emergency that actually connects with people's everyday issues. Yeah. Um, I mean, that that is arguably the challenge of our age. Uh, and as you can imagine, uh, as a Green, it's a thing that I spend quite a lot of time thinking about. So I think that um, at least part of the answer is talking about, spending more time talking about the solutions and less time talking about the problem. Because I think that the, you know, we're lucky in the UK, there isn't very much climate scepticism. The vast majority of people know that climate change is happening, know that it's really serious and something needs to be done about it. But the it, it seems, as you say, it seems kind of difficult and scary and, and not something that people want to think about, understandably. Um, and, and if you talk more, if you tell people about the problem they already know about, they'll just switch off and not want to think about it. So I've, we really need to focus on the solutions and particularly emphasizing that the solutions to climate change often solve other social issues at the same time. So my absolute favorite example of this um, and has been for years before Insulate Britain were a thing is home insulation. Because if you uh, retrofit somebody's home to give it better insulation, heat pumps and so on, then you are reducing their carbon emissions you're also giving them a warmer, more comfortable, healthy home, and you're lowering their fuel bills, which will lift millions of households out of fuel poverty. So that's win, win, win. Um, the, 
there's really no downsides apart from that it's a bit of a logistical exercise to retrofit all of this housing stock in the country. And that's why government, local government and national government needs to get involved in making that happen. How do you I mean, that's the, I mean, kind of partly answering it, but a lot of people think about dealing with the climate emergency in terms of sacrifice, having to give things up and becoming poorer. I mean, that's how anti, that's how right wing populist politicians who fight measures to deal with climate emergency. That's that's what they rely on, isn't it? They talk about job killing policies and all the rest of it. But obviously, you've got a whole there's a whole argument in terms of cheaper, better public transport takes on the climate emergency, makes people's lives better creating green skilled jobs, cleaner air, more green area. I mean, there's a whole range of things you can argue, isn't there? I mean, that, that yeah. but it often doesn't seem for, <clears throat> at the forefront. Yeah, e exactly that. So many of the measures that will um, tackle climate and ecological emergency will also improve people's well-being. And that's, you know, that's ultimately what motivates most people in the greens. You know, we're not, you know, we're not here predominantly for the planet we're here for the people on it and we're here for making people's lives better that's the whole point and I have to say that it isn't just those on the right who make that mistake of of putting climate against kind of social good I'm afraid that I see that from from Labour politicians locally in Bristol and nationally um, constantly voting against proposals that the Greens have put forward or arguing against them on the basis that um, of, of you know, perceived negative impacts it'll have on people on lower incomes, even if the proposals explicitly would benefit people on lower incomes, um, mm. whether it's through providing better services or through, you know, intentionally designing it in a way that, that you know, has a has a social dividend or whatever. It was just a couple of final things. Uh, I mean, linked to that, you're critiquing again correctly Labour's failings on the climate emergency as well as other issues. Arguably one of the most successful political parties of our time is UKIP. Now, UKIP didn't win any seats. Um, the Green Party have one parliamentary seat. That is that is your lot, first past the post. We, you support electoral reform, so do I. But under the current system, that's all you got. But UKIP were really successful because what they did is cause such a panic amongst the Conservative Party and its MPs. They dragged the Conservative Party in their direction to the degree that the Tories basically just became UKIP. I mean, they were UKIPified. Why can't you do the same strategy? Why don't you just do the same thing UKIP did, which should go, look, we're not going to take over. We're not going to form a government. Let's be honest, in the first past the post, very unrealistic. No precedent for a party going from one to forming a majority government in anything like a, you know, a short space of time. So why don't you just UKIP, be a left wing or green UKIP and create such a panic amongst the Labour Party that they are forced to adopt your policies? So, oh gosh, there's a lot of things to unpack there. Um, so first of all, I just want to address the point that you said that, you know, no part, there's no precedent for a party going from one MP to being a majority. In government. this country. Yeah. Labour, and, Labour took half a century. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and the Green Party, by the way, is less than half a century old. So I think we're doing quite good for where we are. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I know that we're not going to be a majority in the next government, but um, w what we could do is be in an alliance with the Labour Party and other parties. And unfortunately, it's the Labour Party that's stopping that happening at the moment. Yeah, you they're know, not we... going to change their position under Keir Starmer on that one. Well, then they're choosing to uh, let the UK have a Tory government for the next five years, because if they worked with other parties, then we would get the Tories out. Um, and that's what the Greens want to see. And that's the offer that we've made to Labour for the last two general elections now. And they've said no. But they won't. And the Tories didn't do that with UKIP either. So UKIP went, fine, sod it. We'll just wage a war of attrition against you until you do what we want. Mm. So we want to get Greens elected um, because we know from, from local experience in England and Wales and from what we've seen Greens achieve in um, the you know, increasing number of other countries where Greens are part of the government in, in um, alliance with other parties, the huge difference it makes when you have Greens in the room. And that that difference is partly in terms of directly having ministerial roles and setting policy. And it is partly in terms of dragging the other parties in the right direction. And I do acknowledge that part of our strength is about getting the other parties to sign up to policies that they wouldn't. 
I obviously have direct personal experience of that. So we were talking about climate emergency. I'm the author of the first climate emergency declaration in Europe, which I took to Bristol City Council in 2018. I got every other councillor from all the other parties on Bristol City Council to vote for it, passed unanimously, which I didn't expect. And then unwittingly, I kicked off this kind of tidal wave of climate emergency declarations that went all across the UK and Europe. Um, as we speak, three quarters of councils have declared a climate emergency. Some of those were led by green councillors, but some of them were led by politicians from other parties who were, um, well, you know, I, depending how charitable I'm feeling, I could either say, um, I, I could either say understood the emergency or I could say jumped on the bandwagon. Um, but, you know, that wouldn't have happened without Greens starting that and showing that it can be done. So so we do influence the other parties and pull them in the right direction. The problem, of course, is do those politicians then follow through on the promises they make and turn it into action? And what we're increasingly finding, um, we've just passed the three year anniversary of the climate emergency declaration in Bristol, which came with a commitment to go carbon neutral by 2030. And while Bristol is, you know, ahead of a lot of UK cities and is doing some good stuff on reducing carbon emissions, it's not going anything like fast enough. And because the Greens currently aren't in the administration in Bristol, though I think that may change next time around, we don't have direct control over the reins to change that. So that's why we, we need to get Greens actually elected into the administrations at a local and national level to make sure that we can make change happen directly ourselves. Finally, the Greens have entered government in European countries because of proportional representation. So uh, they've just re-entered the German government. They were in coalition with the Social Democrats in the past. Now they're in coalition with the Social Democrats and the free market, I should say, FDP. They were in government, for example, in Ireland. I guess it is a bit of a double-edged thing I'd put to you there because on the one hand, you'd be like, Greens, see, all the places they come into government, great shows what can be done. I don't want to be harsh, but they kind of sucked in government. In Ireland, when they went into government, they backed terrible austerity measures and essentially self-immolated. In, under Gerhard Schroeder's government, they backed all sorts of terrible anti-worker policies, uh, which actually ended up damaging the Social Democrats, let alone um, um, what the impact on working people. They attacked workers' rights. And under this government, the right-wing free market, uh, free Democrats, they're going to take the finance ministry. So although actually in LGBTQ rights, some really good proposals have come out in terms of that government, what they're going to do for LGBTQ people, not least trans people, but also gay and bisexual people. But actually you're going to end up with some very right-wing economics, which the Greens are going to go along with. So I guess those people look at that and go, well, the Greens talk a good game in other countries, but then they go into power. They just back really, really, really right wing policies. So, first of all, there are some other, um, you know, progressive economic policies that are going to come out of this um, coalition in Germany uh, if it's agreed by the party members. So increasing the minimum wage, for example. Um, but coalitions by their nature are about compromise and cooperation. It's not about agree, it, you know, going into coalition with another party doesn't mean you agree with them about everything. Kind of by definition, you'd be in the same party if you did. But compromise and cooperation is a good way to do politics. It's not always comfortable, um, but it's the grown up way of doing it. And it, it is how the majority of European countries do it now. You know, the UK is really behind the times in still using this incredibly outdated, not very... Um, not very democratic first past the post system that that basically creates or uh, helps create this very uh, kind of binary oppositional model of politics. But that's uh, what the Lib Dems said. <clears throat> the Lib Dems said all of this when they went into coalition. So sure, then you, do you support what the Lib Dems did? Because the Lib Dems said, "Look, that's the way the cookie crumbles, guys. We don't." Support no, I. Of course, I don't support what the Lib Dems did in coalition with the Conservatives, and the Greens would never go into coalition with the Conservatives. Um, and I think that um, minor parties um, across the world have probably learned quite a big lesson in what not to do from that. Um, but Greens, you know, you, you gave a couple of um, examples that, you know, weren't that positive. But there's also been really positive examples of Greens in government punching well above their weight and able to push through 
radical progressive social and environmental policies in Scotland remember greens are in government in scotland now so you know we don't have to go as far away as germany to see an example um and even though the scottish greens have only been in government for a few months they've already um you know they they made a really strong agreement with the snp they've managed to secure major shifts in policy on fossil fuels on road building um they're going to be tripling uh the spend on active travel transport as opposed to things like road building, doubling onshore wind capacity, um, channeling a £55 million pot of money towards nature recovery, implementing, um, this one's one of my favourites, um, implementing living wage conditionality on all government contracts. So using the Scottish government's power to, to require living wage from, from a lot of their suppliers um, and providing free bus travel to all under 22s from next year. And that's that's things that Greens have secured as part of that agreement. And I think they they negotiated really strongly. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what our what else our sister party in Scotland can achieve. And I think they're really a model. New Zealand's another great one to look at. So in in New Zealand, um, obviously, Jacinda Ardern from Labour, but supported by the Greens in government. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think I think that's a great example where you know there's a there's a pretty progressive Labour uh, government there, but then there's some there's some Greens that are helping to pull them in the right direction on the things that they wouldn't be so hot on otherwise. Finally, very quickly, prediction: How are the Greens going to do in the next year or two? What's your well, what's your what's your baseline for success? Well, um, we've been doing fantastically well over the last few years. So um, a colleague showed me uh, a lovely bar chart of the number of councillors we've got. It's our own it's our own personal Green Party hockey stick. I mean, it literally goes like this. We've nearly tripled our number of councillors in the last three years. So I've got big hopes for these upcoming uh, local elections next year, where we've got local elections um, throughout London and Wales and in lots of other um, parts of the country as well. So I'm expecting a significant uptick in the number of councillors that we've got elected. And of course, <laughs> we've also got an eye further ahead on um, the next general election, whenever that falls, um, where I'm, uh, in case you missed it, um, the party's parliamentary candidate in Bristol West. Oh, and of course, the local MP there is... Thangham Debonair. Oh, so you're yes. going you're gonna, you're gonna to replace Thangham? That's the plan, Yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. I mean, who knows? There's a, there's a big green presence there. Um, Carla, it was a big honour to speak to you about a whole range of issues there. Uh, very comprehensive and made a very punchy case for Green Party prospects and its policies. So, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And yeah, happy to come back anytime you want to ask us anything. And maybe you can have Adrian on next time as well. Oh yeah, I should point out Adrian's the co-leader. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was great to have you, Carla, and yes, I'm sure we will manage that. All right, well, lots of love. Cool. Thanks. Take care.